So without further ado, Kez is going to talk to us about test pumping, comparing the farmer test, constant head test, and SANS methodologies with regards to estimating groundwater abstraction, data analyses, and recommendations. Kez, thank you very much, and I enjoy hearing your talk. Thanks, Jared. Um, yep. Uh, in case anyone missed it earlier, I, firstly, I hope everyone can hear me all fine. Um, I think it's amazing that we're doing this uh, all virtually and mixed and all of that. Um, but um, I'm going to be comparing some of the test pumping results and analyses uh, that I've looked at over the last little while. Um, and particularly, this has uh, relevance in the agricultural sector, where occasionally boreholes are equipped for production without really understanding what type of utilization might be sustainable. So just to quickly go through these methodologies, um, I have distinguished uh, in, in the methodologies, just to clarify it, between a farmer test and a constant head test. Um, but in, in some, of my, some of my results later on, I'll be sort of amalgamating those and putting them together. And, and essentially, the all testing really should start with putting in a, a borehole pump that can uh, uh, pump higher than the expected yield. Um, this was a failing in, in my talk earlier in some of the examples I gave there. But essentially, you want a pump that can stress out the borehole. Um, that's sort of where things uh, depart between the two methodologies. In the farmer test, what is essentially done is the water level is dropped to pump inlet um, as fast as possible. Um, in a constant head test, the main distinction is just that it's pumped to a specified level as fast as possible. Whereas in the SANS 10299 um, testing, we normally talk, talking about doing a step test first or even a calibration test before that to look at what the water level starts doing at different pumping rates. Um, the next step in a farmer test or a constant head test would be to roughly speaking, maintain the water level at that depth. So sometimes this is a slightly choked pump inlet. Sometimes it's a specified level with a logger um, and a VSD control on the test pump. Um, but either way, we're talking about keeping a constant level and looking at what the flow rate does over time and, and a specified time duration in which to monitor that. Whereas uh, by comparison in a constant discharge test, we're having a constant flow rate and we're monitoring the drawdown or the drop in water level of time. And that's a very important distinction. Um, and sometimes we're also monitoring other boreholes in the area. And then a crucially important thing is at the end of this, um, sometimes in a farmer test, you'll get an occasional note on recovery. And I'll show some examples of this constant head test. Sometimes the recovery is even monitored a little bit. Um, usually I haven't seen it done very well. Um, but as part of the SANS 10299 testing, we really need to make sure we get good uh, recovery monitoring data. So I'm going to redact these um, because I understand there might be recordings of this, um, and I want to make sure that um, they get shot. But uh, these are a couple of examples of farmer tests or constant head tests, just to take a look at what the certificates or results look like. Um, we have some sort of a one-pager type of thing, and, and importantly, sometimes there's a starting water level that's measured, but essentially what we're talking about is a couple of hours, this example, six hours, um, a borehole is said to have been pumped at a certain rate, and essentially what happens is a percentage of that rate is then recommended to the farmer um, or, or the owner of the ball. This is another example from a bit, a bit older. You can see we've got a little bit of water level monitoring on the right-hand column of this example. And here we have something that's starting to look almost somewhat scientific, um, I think just by default of the fact that it looks like it's been put into Excel. But um, we also have water level that's being measured above the pump, uh, dropped to a certain level. So this would actually be starting to be something close to a constant head test. And then we have a, a measurement hourly of what the volume coming out of the borehole is. And at the bottom over there, we can see there's a short comment on the recovery time. And they also repeated the test twice um, as if to add some validity to the results. If we compare this to what a, a proper test actually looks like, whether we're doing a step test or a constant discharge test as part of the SANS 10299 testing, um, this is an example that I've taken from one of the contractors that we frequently use um, in the Western Cape and in, in other provinces as well, 80 pumps. And this is an example of a step test. You can see there's quite frequent uh, readings. I'm going to zoom in on this just for a second to show, you know, we have drawdown measured at quite high intervals. We're trying to get a fixed flow rate quite early on in each step. It's not perfect, but it's you're trying to get it there as quickly as possible. Um, and then we have monitored drawdown uh, for each step and then it continues and we take recovery after that. So if we look at what that looks like um, in a graph or in time series, we have monitored drawdown as meters below the, the starting water level or the rest water level or the static water level, depending on the conditions prior to testing. 
Um, and hopefully by the end of it, we stress the drawdown to a point that we either get to pump inlet or a great uh, percentage of our available drawdown in which to work. And then we run a constant discharge test. Um, this can be one day, two days, three days, five days, et cetera. Um, and we take recovery monitoring after that. And it's really the time series drawdown analysis of this constant discharge data that we are using to analyze and make recommendations on and the subsequent recovery thereafter. This is the same test uh, just to show how things can look a little bit different when we plot them in semi-log time or on a semi-log plot with logarithmic time. Um, and to sort of quickly take a look, this is an example that I touched on briefly earlier um, at Matterville, where they had a borehole that was drilled that was uh, the testing of the borehole. This is the step test information that we get, constant discharge um, information that we get at 1.4 liters per second. Um, the green line over here is the derivative or the rate of decline of the drawdown, um, and the orange points over there are the, the second derivative for the acceleration in decline um, of the drawdown in the borehole during that test. And so we can come up with a list of recommendations on how to use the borehole. In this case, it was recommended to pump the borehole at 0.6 liters per second continuously. And then if we start monitoring that, we can see that the the, ex the expected water levels from our test pumping data match quite closely um, with the monitored water levels when we start actually use it, using this. Um, and I would just, a quick side note to say uh, sort of congratulations or, or to give credit to the town of Maraville and, the, and the, the support structure within that municipality. I mean, they've set up some really professional production borehole sites over there um, to run things in a safe, sustainable manner. And they're really monitoring oriented in terms of how they manage their water supplies over there. So it's fantastic to see these things being done properly um, compared to how, how some boreholes look in the field. Um, a brief example of what I'll sort of step back onto a bit later is this is one specific borehole that's had a farmer test as well as a proper test. Um, and the, the two things that I'm highlighting over here is the starting water level before the farmer test was done in 2015. And then we can see the test was five hours. They ended up with a pumping rate of 36,000 liters an hour, which is about 10 liters a second. And the recommendation was 75% of that. Um, now, this borehole was subsequently used based on these recommendations, equipped with a production pump and used. And, and then we came back later or later in time earlier this year to, to retest the borehole uh, because the testing that had been done was insufficient for a license application to legalize use of the water. And if we take a quick look, the static water level before the farmer test was 34 meters below surface. The resting water level without the pump on by the time we got there a few years later was now 68 meters below surface. So this is a gross mismanagement of the resource and over abstraction of the specific borehole. We also try to run a CDT at less than half what the recommended sustainable rate was based on the farmer test. Um, the lowest we could get on the pump that we brought to site was 3.2 liters per second. And that couldn't even last more than about seven hours before failing and reaching pump inlet. So this has been totally over abstracted uh, based on the recommendations of one of these tests, um, which are not, not valid. So I put together that exact type of case study, but for 25 boreholes across the Western Cape. And you can see the areas that, that I pulled these from, it's just from projects here and there over the last few years. Um, and, and so what I compared was the rate that a farmer test was done at, um, the rate that was recommended from that farmer test, and quite often the results are presented in a certification manner, which in other words, to sort of indicate the borehole's been tested and certified for this yield. So that recommendation is 100% of the farmer test rate. Um, so I compared the farmer test rate to the constant discharge test rate that we ended up testing the borehole correctly at, and then also the recommended the recommendations from the farmer test to recommendations based on the analysis of scientifically testing the borehole according to our national standards. And there's a couple of examples where it looks like, you know, maybe it's not too bad, um, where we're dealing with, you know, maybe a 10% reduction, a 15% reduction, a 20% reduction. There wasn't a single case where scientifically it seemed reasonable to recommend a higher rate than what had been recommended through a farmer test. Um, but then there's a couple of cases where it's 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 really quite shocking to see the to see the discrepancies. Um, you know, so we start talking about to look at some of the bottom examples over there, a recommendation of 
seven and a half liters per second compared to half a liter per second. A recommendation of 15 and a half liters per second compared to five and a half liters per second. And it's really, it gets a little bit shocking to see this um, when, when, when we start comparing the results in this manner. So this is spatially where these where these results came from. Um, I try to get a good representation um, spatially as well as across a variety of different aquifers. So there's primary aquifers included, there's fractured secondary aquifers included, there's within the fractured rock aquifers, there's mounds, pre group, table mountain group, um, one or two in the granites as well. Um, so we've got quite a, it's not to say that this is an isolated example that I'm giving within a very specific environment. This is, you know, fairly representative. Um, quick note on the, on the data before I get in there, there are five boreholes that are all on one property. So that does slightly skew the statistics that I'll present in a minute. But um, but overall, you know, not too bad. And so this is essentially the same data that I displayed earlier, but shown graphically. And on the primary vertical scale, or the, the left-hand vertical scale, we have the, the rates in liters per second. And what's being compared here is bars of the farmer test pumping rate, the farmer test recommended rate in the solid rate bar, and then compared to the constant discharge test rate and the scientifically recommended uh, long-term production rate. And I've added, I know there might be people watching who are used to working in cubes and hours, so the right-hand axis is there. And we've got quite a range in terms of yields of boreholes. I mean, if we're looking at liters per second, um, you know, we're going, you know, percentage of a single liter per second up to about 30 odd liters per second. And to put that into cubes an hour, we're going from a couple of cubes an hour up to about a hundred cubes an hour. So again, this isn't representative of a specific rate or hole where this sort of uh, misrecommendation is occurring. It, it occurs across a variety of rates as well. Um, if we pull out the testing rate and we just look at the recommendations made, it starts to become a bit more clear um, that in some cases it looks like it's maybe above 50 percent but the vast majority of the cases are really dropping the rates quite a lot lower than what's recommended from a from a farmer test um, and so to normalize across the the actual pumping rates themselves and just look at the percentage difference this is now for each of those 25 examples an individual borehole we test it scientifically what is the recommendation that we make as a percentage of what the recommendation was from testing the same borehole but with the incorrect methodology and you can see we've got the sort of the odd 80 to 90 type thing but we're also dropping quite quite low at the 10 to 25 percent range and so if we put and this is sort of uh, my closing slide before closing comments um if we put a a little chart of this together this is where we really start seeing the damage um Average recommended pumping rate from a farmer test method was more than double what was recommended scientifically. Um, if we if we take a look at sort of number of tests, half of the recommendations were three times higher, three times or more um, what was recommended scientifically. Um, and it's really when we get to sort of the worst of the worst that we start seeing uh, in this specific case, which was the case that I displayed earlier, we ended up needing to make a 93% reduction in the recommended pumping rate compared to what the recommended rate was from doing a farmer test on the same exact borehole. Um, and so to bring it all together, there's a couple of things that I'd like to just highlight. Firstly, I mean, as hydrogeologists, we know this, but definitely we need to get the word out there. Testing a borehole is not just a case of measuring water flow out of a borehole. Um, something that we should note as well is it's easy to look down on these farmer tests and pump inlet tests um, because of the poor results like what I've shown over here. In many cases, if we did the same test for maybe three months, you know, a farmer test for three months or six months, feasibly, I'm not saying that's a that's a great option or financially, but but we'd probably end up with quite accurate results when we compare those types of results. Um, a big a big setback is that uh, the farmer test methodology and the constant head test methodology as far as i'm aware don't have specified ways to analyze um, boundary conditions within aquifers and seeing as we don't exist in an infinite ideal homogeneous environment um, we do have to account for boundary conditions when we look at production out of aquifers um, and, and utilizing these resources and then it's it's very common to hear this type of thing on site whether it's from a driller or a poor pumping test methodology, the recommendations are frequently sort of primary school level fractions 
um, of what happens on site. So borehole is 10 cubes an hour. If you only use seven cubes an hour, you know that you're being sustainable because you're leaving that 30% behind. And it's just nonsense. There's no basis in scientific methodology that's irrespective of where the water level is, what the available drawdown from rest water level to main strike is, uh, what the long-term impacts are of other boreholes in the area, what the boundary conditions. It's just it's just nonsense to talk like this. But it, to someone who's you know not used to dealing with hydrogeology, this can sound very convincing. Oh, I'm, I'm only taking half, and I'm leaving half behind. I must be being I must be a, you know sustainable user of groundwater resources. But it's it's just nonsense. Um, lastly, there is really an ethical concern, um, and this has been highlighted quite vividly to me in the last couple of weeks specifically. If we have irrigation equipment suppliers coming to site to do incorrect testing methodologies, which quite often over, overestimate what a borehole can produce, if they then supply a pump which is suited for a higher yield, it's firstly, there's a higher cost on the pump. Secondly, when it does start over abstracting, that is probably going to cause issues with the pump. And so, sort of the guaranteed work of regularly having to service it, replace it, clean it, that type of thing. Um, there's an ethical question being raised over there, which I'm not saying it's all cases like that, but we need to be able to ask that question and say, is this able to be answered ethically? Um, or is it a concern that some of these boreholes are being totally over abstracted and regularly serviced and replaced by the same company over and over again? And that on the client's end, they just don't understand that that's that's not necessary at all. Um, so I hope that highlights the differences between the testing methodologies. I hope that illustrates that uh, through scientific testing, we can have a much better understanding of how to use a borehole sustainably. And I hope there was some level of enjoyment in this talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting as always. Um, I think we're just going to give a bit of time for the questions to come through because we're a bit delayed. I have about 30 seconds that we come in between everyone and just. The resounding silence on questions is definitely appreciated. Um, but if there are any, I'm happy to address them. I think there are some questions coming through. I'm just waiting to get them on my side so I can ask them. Okay, we have found a second way to do this. Okay, yeah, uh, Roger Parsons has asked, it's a unique data set. Have you thought about publishing an article in Farmers Weekly or Lundbo uh, Werkblatt? Um, what do you think this would make this issue more visible? Uh, thanks, Roger. Um, yes, the idea is to, Firstly, I'd, I'd need to look at this a bit more intensively. I'd love to add a couple of examples to it and really bulk up um, bulk up the number of tests that are compared. Um, I'd love to get into the order of you know, 40, 50, 60 tests um, so that the statistics become a bit more meaningful. I, I do want to, I'd like to publish it scientifically in terms of looking at uh, the confidence in the recommendation made from scientific test pumping data analysis, because there is, uh, and, I th and I think this is also a study that should be done. You can take the same data set from test pumping a borehole and give it to 10 hydrogeologists and come up with 10 slightly different answers. So there needs to be a little bit of um, data certainty and error correction on that side of things. But the intention is definitely to look at publishing this um, and, and hopefully use this as motivation to start talking to people on site and, and specifically within the agricultural sector, not just to make it an academic exercise. Um, 
and and to start educating them on 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 how this should be done better. I've personally, uh, it's a very difficult conversation to have because I feel like the conversation needs to be had with the irrigation companies that are conducting these tests. Um, and I've tried to do that on a few occasions. Usually, doesn't end well if it gets started. Um, but it is something that it would. I've wanted a reference to show other companies to say this is why you shouldn't be doing this. Um, so if if I'm the person that is going to produce that reference, then I'm very happy to take it on. But I need a bit of time to uh, finesse the results and and make it a bit more robust um, for the long term reliability of the study. Thanks. Okay, Kez, we've got a couple more questions in the chat and we've got two minutes left, so let's see if we can pump through them. Uh, Dale asks, irrigation companies often members of the BWA are the ones selling these false tests, if you want to call them that. They need to be the ones who understand the consequences of what they're doing. Uh, could you maybe just comment on it and think, how would we direct it to them and how can we get the public to put pressure on them as well? Yeah, I think that's totally unacceptable. Um, it is sort of what I addressed in the previous uh, answer as well, that you know this discussion does, does have to be had with the contractors that are doing that type of thing. Um, I, think, I think there are some ties to be made with Matthias's talk right at the beginning about being professional and being held liable and accountable for recommendations made. Um, I'm not quite sure how close those ties should be, but, but I think they should be included at some level. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Kez. Uh, if I could ask you to just address the rest of the questions in the chat, uh, I think we need to move forward just for time constraints. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing some of your answers to the questions there.